Hey, welcome back. I'm Hammer, and this is Happening Now with Hammer. Hey, before we get started today, I want to say thank you to all of you guys out there. You're subscribing, you're liking, and and we're just thrilled that you like our content and you like what we're doing. So just keep staying with us. You know, we're all about Newport Beach and what's happening in Newport Beach. And today we got a real exciting show because the summertime is coming. Well, it's here. And you need to come down to Newport Beach and check us out, the restaurants, the hotels, see what's going on here in Newport Beach. So, Troy, let me ask you a question. We've got Troy from the Agency Realty. He's the expert guru of real estate in Newport Beach. Troy, what's going on today? I tell you, 35 years doing it, I better be an expert by now. I know all those neighborhoods. Uh, what's going on so. today is uh, we've got Mr. Newport. I'm going to give him a new title today. Mr. Newport here with us. A gentleman I met many, many years ago when I was working with the Newport Beach Film Festival, which is an incredible event that Newport puts on. Uh, and uh, he is the president and CEO of Visit Newport Beach, Mr. Gary Sherwin. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, Troy. It's great to be here. Hey, Gary. How's your day going today? Terrific, Hammer. Another you know, great day here. You know, how can we complain? Oh, exactly. And it must be getting, you're probably getting geared up for uh, the summertime, I would imagine, right? We are. This is going to be high season, and uh, this is going to be a particularly meaningful and, uh, you know, I think uh, busy summer and one that will probably be considerably more profitable than the one we've had over the last year or so. Absolutely. But, and I would think it's going to be probably one of the best ever because people are got that cabin fever. They do. There's a whole thing now called revenge tourism where people have said, you know what, I've, you know, I've been living my life without for a while and I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, live my best life and spend like crazy. And uh, now I'm going to splurge on luxury goods, luxury travel, luxury meals, because I owe it to myself. I heard so. all the airlines are pushing back on that phraseology. They don't like the revenge term when people are booking their flights. <laughs> yeah. Whatever we call it, there are a lot of aching wallets across the country, yes, and they're they about to be relieved. They are, and they're very full, and they, uh, they definitely want to get out there and empty themselves. Gary, give us a little picture of what you do at Visit Newport Beach. Well, you know, we're, uh, so I call ourselves the global marketing agency for Newport Beach. You know, every great brand, whether it's Apple or Tesla or Disney, they all have a really robust marketing program behind them because it's not enough to just have something great. You have to also tell the story, you have to explain it, and you can never take customers for granted. I mean, you know, Disneyland, everyone knows Disneyland. Uh, it's a global icon of a destination, but it has literally, you know, hundreds of people in their marketing department telling the story. And that's kind of what we try to do here uh, for Newport Beach. We are a luxury, what we call aspirational brand, one that you know has an appeal beyond just being a city. Uh, people come here because they like our way of life. They want to be one of us. They want to enjoy something that's a little bit outside the ordinary of what they're experiencing at home. And so we try to tell that story through all the means of a traditional marketing agency, whether it's advertising, public relations, digital media. Uh, and we do it both on a domestic uh, basis, here in the United States and certainly in the Western United States. Um, and then globally, um, we are a global destination. We have visitors that come from the Middle East, from the UK, from Canada. Uh, those are all markets where we have a sustained presence. And our job is to bring as much money to town as possible. And tourism is a $1 billion a year business. And that is correct. That's billion with a B. A lot of people think in a little Newport Beach, a billion dollars, but it's true. Uh, if you look at the overall spend of the visitors at hotels, restaurants, uh, at places like Fashion Island, there's a significant amount of economic impact. And we're sort of the economic generator for the city. Gary, is this, this is your child, isn't it? You created this, what, 15 years ago or so? Well, we, you know, we created the Newport Beach and Company kind of umbrella organization. And the organization itself, um, Newport Beach Conference and Visitors Bureau, which is what it was called when I joined in 2006, um, it, was, it was really just focused solely on tourism. And then after some discussions with a lot of our leaders, they said, you know, we're, you know, there's a lot of marketing here beyond just tourism. There's, you know, the restaurants, there are neighborhoods. Um, you know, I, we have Newport Beach TV, which is the city's TV 
station. Um, they're all, you know, there's the Christmas boat parade, which had been going on, but it was really seen as this great little regional uh, attraction. We thought it had potential to really be a global phenomenon. Um, so what we decided to do is create this kind of integrated umbrella arm that will sell all the collective assets of Newport Beach. And that's how Newport Beach and Company was born probably in early 2013. Gary, you kind of blow my head up when you start talking about marketing Newport Beach, number one, as a brand. I suppose you can talk about that in a second. But beyond that, how do you say, okay, let's focus on the Japanese market. Let's focus on Russia. Let's focus on Europe. How do you identify who you think may be coming here, where to spend those dollars to get those people, and who do you approach in those places? Well, uh, data don't lie. So, you know, we are very kind of metric oriented, like all the companies I was talking about earlier, they all rely on good data points of where potential customers are and the trends in terms of what people want to buy, how they want to buy it. So, you know, a few years ago, we really started investing in research and, and we learned that the area here in Southern California, more and more international visitors are coming. And um, this all kind of changed in 2020, but I think it'll probably regain its footing. But, you know, China, for example, wasn't even the top 10 of uh, inbound visitation into California uh, as recently as seven years ago. Um, before the pandemic, it was number one in, in the state. Um, the UK, we started seeing more visitors coming from the UK. We started seeing more visitors coming in from Canada. Um, and so we said, you know, we need to really make a presence. The problem is, is that we want to be there and so do most of the cities here in Southern California and many cities around the country. So how do we kind of break out? How do we compete? How do we find ways to make a meaningful uh, inroad into those markets? So we kind of chop it up a little bit and say, okay, we're not going to go after every Chinese visitor. Maybe what we're going to do is go after the luxury Chinese visitor, or we're going to go after, um, you know, some of the younger women who want to come over here and shop. That's a very big deal for them. Maybe we go and try to target them. Uh, in the UK, we decided we're going to go after what we call luxury tour operators, people who do nothing but package U.S. destinations and bring people here. So it's a highly segmented, very strategic approach to trying to go out and pull out visitors who we think have the highest propensity to buy from us, which is kind of the way any business would want to work, right? It's just we, pl we play it on a citywide scale rather than, you know, a you know, office. Gary, hasn't a lot of that changed in the last 10 or 15 years? Because I've been here a long time and we were just that little beach town with the dive bars and not really any great hotels and all that kind of, you know, just the, the little town, kind of the Mayberry of the beach. And now, you know, we're becoming a cosmopolitan, the Lido house and all these wonderful things right. that are happening. Right. It is. And I, I would kind of point to the opening of Pelican Hill in 2008 as uh, kind of a major turning point because uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we didn't have much presence uh, even in the meetings and conventions market uh, for many years. Uh, we had just the Four Seasons Hotel, which is now the Island Hotel. Uh, the Balboa Bay Resort just really kind of turned into a hotel in 2003. Um, the Marriott uh, had to go through a major renovation in about 2006. It was not particularly an attractive product at the time. Um, so you're absolutely right. We were not on the forefront of, of tourism. We got some of it, and there were a lot of people who came and stayed on the peninsula and rented homes. But from a, a real global perspective, Pelican Hill was the game changer because that gave us a truly five and six star product that we can then go out into the global marketplace and say, we are truly a destination resort. And out of that, I think every it kind of raised everyone's game. And they said, you know, we're getting a better quality of guest here. So we need to offer a better product. So Bob Olson, who developed Lido House said, you know, we're not going to build just a hotel. We're going to build a Newport Beach centric brand defining hotel that caters to the luxury market. And all the other hotels realized that they couldn't play at the same game and they invested and improved their products. So with that, that attracted more of the kind of customers that we see today. You know, the thing that's kind of interesting that most people don't know about this, you know, you go to Jersey or New York and you got the boroughs, you got the five boroughs, you got all this kind of stuff. We've kind of got that same thing. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to call them boroughs, but, you know, we got the Back Bay. We've got Cannery Village, all those interesting things that people don't know about. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, we, we don't sell Newport Beach as a monolith. We actually sell it as a collection of neighborhoods because they truly are, to your point, unique. So, you know, uh, when we, when people say, well, how do you sell Newport Beach? Well, first and foremost, we sell it as a lifestyle, but then we say, okay, for your lifestyle, what are you looking for? There are people who want the Uber luxury lifestyle and you can find that at Pelican Hill and they can go shopping at Fashion Island and eat at some really nice upscale restaurants. But there's another lifestyle aspect to it. And it's a much more casual beachy lifestyle where you bring kids and they walk down Marine Avenue on Balboa Island and they walk into the the candy store and you're in shorts and flip-flops and it's a you know a, a totally unique southern california hang um there are people who you know want the lifestyle that's embodied in corona del mar there are people who want the lifestyle closer to the beach you know we are a collection of various experiences within a really small geographic area our job is to kind of define those areas and then say what is the experience that you want because not everyone has to have the same experience when they come to town because of the diversity of our neighborhoods. So is that a, is that a different marketing tact where you're going after certain uh, clientele will be restaurant per se, uh, other clientele, you want the high end hotels, other it's all about boating in our harbor. Do you separate that out or do you try to package that to all of your uh, folks you're going after? You know what we did uh, starting last year, we said um, we really need to really get into who our customers are. So we actually did what we call development of these personas. And it's a really clearly defined understanding of uh, the type of person we want to go after. So for example, one of the segments we go after are what we call food pornographers, right? These are the people <laughs> who take pictures of their food. They talk about the food. They're proud of every restaurant they go to. They have to brag about it, try some weird dish, all of that stuff. There are people who just, that's their lifestyle. They, they're they consumed by it. So we know where they live, say in Southern California, and we can find ways to car target them specifically as to the dining experience and what we offer. So we kind of come up with those type of things. We have fashionistas, we have people who go after spas. So we really kind of take a look at our attributes and then match up customers to our attributes. Did you actually have to kind of uh, take a look at today's society where we've got influencers? Is that, do you oh, go yeah. after them as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Influencers are, you know, a major part of what we do in terms of public relations. You know, there was a time where, you know, years ago where travel sections were a big deal, right? You know, newspapers don't have travel sections anymore. It's influencers. But you have to be able to choose the right influencer to make sure they're re reaching the right market for us. Not all influencers are created equal. Not everyone reaches the type of customer that we want. Uh, because again, we're going after people who can afford to spend a fair amount of money to come to Newport Beach. We're, we're here to generate economic impact. So we want to make sure we're going after the right people who have the ability to do that. Well, all I can say this last couple of weekends, uh, it's been, uh, you know, I know it's been busy. Open doors. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the floodgates are open. It is. Yeah. You know? They're all they're all coming. And it really turned, I think, um, during that President's Day, Valentine's Day weekend, it was all the same weekend. And uh, the switch kind of flipped. And I think people said, OK, enough with this. Uh, I'm coming back. And that has shown our steady progression in terms of hotel occupancy and visitor volume. We're not where we need to be, but it, we're getting there. Gary, you guys offer what you call like a familiarization tour. What's that all about? And who do you who qualifies for that? Well, if you're a media person um, and we want to bring you here to town, um, say if you're writing for a publication in the UK or a broadcast person, um, we bring you out here. Sometimes the airlines will work with us and provide airfare. Uh, we put you up at hotels and we construct an itinerary based on your unique interest. And then we will have somebody kind of escort you around to kind of show you uh, the destination and set up interviews. Uh, we do that on the media side, but on the, on the other side of it uh, are our meeting planners. And one of the big kind of assumptions in, in Newport Beach, I think, is that everyone thinks that it's just the people vacationing here that are paying the bills for the hotels. And, and the reality is the hotels, uh, certainly the big ones, rely on meetings at conventions. They cannot be profitable without meetings at conventions. Leisure guests are great. We love them. They're going to sustain us through most of 2021. But what we're really looking for the return are uh, clients who come out 
book meetings, they book large number of room nights, they buy food and beverage, they do offsite events, they go on hornblower cruises. That's where a lot of revenue comes from. Um, and we bring those people out and we have a whole team of people who do nothing but sell Newport Beach for meetings and conventions literally all over the country. And we bring those folks out, we set up a familiarization tour, sometimes we call a side inspection. And uh, usually 65% of the time, we've quantified it, 65% of the time we could bring a client here from say New York and show them Newport Beach, they will bring their meeting here and book the business. Where do I sign up? <laughs> no, sounds what, beautiful. What I'd like to know is how do you, okay, let's say I've got a company, I've got 50 employees and I'm on the East Coast and I'm looking at Newport Beach, um, you know, and we have a budget. So do you work with their budget? Can you figure all that out? Is that, is that all calculated into it? It is. We, we've got a team of people who have been doing this for a long time. And, you know, if we get an opportunity, uh, say a new lead for a piece of business, you know, we'll, we'll do our due diligence. We'll take a look at where you've gone before, what kind of plans you've done. Maybe we will talk to the hotel where you last had your last meeting. Um, we'll understand your background. And then we get to know who you are and what you're looking for and what your delegates are looking for. And uh, then we kind of see if there's going to be a good match there. And so if there is, and there's a possibility that you could bring the business to town, then we will set anything up to help you make that decision. So let me, let me back up a little bit here. Um, Gary, let's, let's talk about your career in a totally different place because this is all water bound, but you used to be in the desert. Mm -hmm. So yeah. tell us a little bit about uh, the Palm Springs and what, what you did over there. That was a really fun job. Uh, I was head of marketing there for over seven years and it was the whole Coachella Valley. It wasn't just the city of Palm Springs. Uh, the way their tourism operation is set up, it's um, all the cities kind of joined together to sell it under this Palm Springs Desert Resorts kind of name. And uh, well, Palm so, Springs is a sexy name. So you want to use that. Yeah. It does. And it's the one everyone knows it as, you know, right. I mean, that's part of the challenge we had is we had cities like Palm Desert and Indian Wells saying, hey, we're about ready to be a famous any moment now. Why are we calling this the Palm Springs area? And it's like, because everyone knows it is Palm Springs. You know, people unfortunately don't know Indian Wells that well. Um, so we had to do that. Yeah, but Indian Wells has all the water rights. <laughs> yeah, well. And the tennis courts. <laughs> and a great tennis facility, yeah, by the way. Yeah. They do. So, uh, yeah, and my job was to really kind of help, you know, tell that story and get it out there. I mean, one of the things that... Uh, started while we were there is, you know, Palm Springs is known as a place for uh, modernism now and, you know, the whole uh, modernism architecture style. That was not a thing um, years ago. And we worked with a reporter from the New Yorker magazine. Uh, they did a story on Palm Springs modernism and they went and took a look at some of the classic architecture, did a story, said this is really cool. And literally out of that one story became the whole trend. Um, and it literally took off from there. And now we have Palm Springs Modernism Week. But, you know, we, you know, Palm Springs has a very rich history for not being a particularly old city um, and, and the region. I mean, you know, it was obviously has, um, you know, they, they have the Agua Caliente Indians. Uh, they own every other square mile in the city of Palm Springs. Um, they have, uh, a, you know, obviously a, still a very strong presence there. Um, and then you know, there was the whole Hollywood connection, too, which was fascinating because the reason Palm Springs became the way it was from a Hollywood set is, you know, when you were part of the studio system back in the 40s and 50s, you could not travel more than 100 miles on a weekend in case a director wanted to do a pickup shot. So if you were, you know, more than a couple, a hundred, uh, a couple hours away and someone needed you to show up to fill in on Saturday because they needed that shot, you needed to be there. So that was far enough away so that people really felt like they could escape, but close enough that they had to get back. And so it started attracting these amazing people who began to see it as, you know, this retreat, this escape, uh, and then eventually a second home for many of them. And obviously Frank Sinatra was a big one. Bob Hope was a big one. Marilyn Monroe was out there. I mean, all the stories of debauchery and craziness <laughs> yeah. and all the stuff. I mean, it's, it goes on and on. It's yeah, just, Elvis it was is, a fun uh, story to tell. Elvis's uh, uh, house is, uh, his, uh, what does it call it? The honeymoon, honeymoon house. house. Yeah. Honeymoon yeah. House yeah. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. Sinatra's place out there that's on the cliff. 
Yep, that's actually for sale house. right now as well. Yeah, well, there's there's the Bob Hope House that's up on the ha- up on the hill that yeah. uh, looks like a airplane terminal. Sinatra actually had a compound in Rancho Mirage that he moved to in 1948, and um, you know there's a book out right now. Jake Tapper from CNN wrote a book, this fictional book, and it's about Sinatra and it takes place in, on the compound. Part of it does. And and I actually did the first interview with, um, I don't know if people still remember Huell Hauser from PBS. I love oh, yeah. um, <laughs> Huel was a great friend and we got the very first show inside the compound. Uh, Sinatra's had sold it, but they sold it to a gentleman named Jim Pattison. And they said, you know, he, he said, listen, Mrs. Sinatra, he did the deal with her. He said, if I'll, I'll take the place, I'll pay about 6 million for it, but you got to leave everything here. You basically take your jockey shorts and leave everything else. I want all the tchotchkes. I want everything here. Just leave. And uh, she said, well, I want a piano in the living room. And there's this helipad, which we were originally when uh, John F. Kennedy was supposed to stay there uh, and he converted into a rose garden. And, and Robert Schuller uh, from the Crystal Cathedral Crystal had given Cathedral. them this large sculpture of this bronze horse. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to take that sculpture. And he says, you could take the piano. You take the sculpture, deal is dead. She took the piano, they took the six million dollars. <laughs> he moved in, and then we came in with a film crew and shot the whole compound, which was an amazing experience. Because when you walk through that, and it was not opulent. Everyone thinks it was Sinatra was opulent. It was not opulent at all. But boy, did you feel Frank's vibe in that place. It was great. <laughs> It was a wonderful experience. Well, it's like if you go out to Liberace's old house, it wasn't mm-hmm. very opulent. Everybody right. thought it was, but back then they weren't. Right. No. You know, small little houses. Yeah. But okay, there seems to be a theme here. Uh, you seem to make things pop whatever city you go to. So destination brand science. Okay. You, you, you're you a co-author on a book, and that probably has a lot to do with you making all this so successful. Share that with us, if you would. Well, um, several years ago, um, it was it was interesting. I was having lunch with the general manager at the Marriott Desert Springs, which is the big behemoth thousand room hotel in Palm Desert. And he took me to lunch one day and he says, Gary, you know, Marriott is building the very same hotel like ours in Phoenix. It's actually, you know, it's in northern and called um, uh, Desert Ridge. And uh, I think it's really going to hurt us. It's probably going to kick our butts because it'll be a better version of this hotel. They're going to take all the bugs of this hotel, fix them, build a a better, newer version. And we don't know how to compete against that. So you figure out how we're going to compete against the same hotel in Phoenix because I know we're going to lose market share. So go figure it out. And I went, wait a second. It's your hotel. It's in Marriott. It's why are you putting the problem? He says, because I don't have a solution. So you figure it out. So we started thinking about it and it was like, well, you know, how do you compete as a place, as a city? Right. And so we thought, you know, what we really can compete on is experience. You know, we think, you know, when you come to to Palm Springs, you land at the airport. It's called a resort port. Uh, it's a very immersive experience. If any of you have been to Palm Springs Airport, you'll see it's palm trees and it's very lush oh, yeah. and beautiful. it's it, it's a beautiful airport. You know, if you land into Phoenix, you're landing at Sky Harbor. It's a fine airport, but you're in the middle of an urban core. Then you get on a freeway and you're battling traffic. And then eventually you make it to this nice hotel. But that whole experience has been very urban, very dense, maybe not all that different from what you left behind. Palm Springs, completely different. We thought, you know, there's, there's a kernel of something there that we need to take a look at. So we started developing this idea of could a place like a product become a brand? You know, um, I mentioned, you know, the Disney and the Teslas and the Apples and all that. Those are all well-defined brands. And why? Because you have an emotional connection with all of them, right? I mean, you don't go to Disney because of the ride. You're going because it's the most magical place in the world, right? The happiest place on the planet? That's, I, I, they call it happiest. I call it magical. I don't know, but it's, you feel it. You feel it, right? So, um, so we said, you know, what we need to think about is developing a brand strategy that really is based on emotional appeals as well as what we call functional appeals, which is the stuff, the things that you sell. And I think we can then really come up with a strategy that will help us win. And so out of that, we came up with a brand new Palm Springs brand. And again, it's not about logos. It's not about taglines. Tourism organizations get blamed for lame 
taglines and logos all the time. They are, many of them are vacuous. They're stupid. They mean nothing to the customer. People call it branding. I'm talking about something a little deeper than that. And, but you have to really go within and ask yourself good questions. And we did it and it worked out really well. And we gained market share off Phoenix because of that. And subsequently the industry asked me to write a book on the process, how you go about branding a destination, which was still a weird concept. Weird and now concept, it's kind of that, accepted way of still, business. Yeah, that's still the uh, benchmark though for cities across the country and perhaps the world. So congratulations on that book and being right even back then and still today. Well, you know, it was fun. It was kind of a labor of love. I did it, you know, I wrote it during a summer. So I was kind of cooped up inside it because I'm living in Palm Springs. It's 120 degrees heat out there. So <laughs> it was a good way to kind of wild my summer. And I just wrote every day and, and eventually it got out there. But it was kind of interesting how it kind of got people to think about how do you sell uh, places differently than what we've done before, because before er, it was very advertising driven. So, um, and now it's deeper than that. So Gary, I'm in Minnesota, let's say, and I've got a family of four. Uh, where do I go to find out how fabulous Newport Beach is? Well, we have obviously a huge digital presence um, at visitnewportbeach.com. And that really is all of the resources that you could find from attractions, restaurants, hotels, and such. Uh, we have portals in which, you know, you can then book your hotel experience. But our job is to tell that very robust story so that you can decide where uh, you want to stay, what kind of experience you want to have for you and the people you're bringing uh, with you, whether it's pet friendly, whether you need to have walkable destination, whether or not you want oceanfront, uh, luxury, something a little bit more budget, it, it's all there for you. So Gary, I want to thank you very much for coming down to Happening Now. We really appreciate it. Uh, we love Visit Newport Beach and it's a great site. And for everybody out there that's going to come to Newport, go to visitnewportbeach.com. It's gonna tell you everything. I don't care what you're doing. It tells you all the great bars, all the, the hotels. If you wanna rent an electric bike, if you wanna go surfing, it tells you everything. If you wanna go check out the whales, visitnewportbeach.com. Guys, we love you. We'll see you next time on Happening Now. <music>